Hello and welcome to History for Weirdos. We're your hosts, Andrew and Stephanie. And each week, we're going to take you on a journey into the strange, obscure, and relentlessly entertaining corners of human history. Now listen up, friends, because it's about to get weird. Welcome back, weirdos, to another episode of History for Weirdos. Welcome back, weirdos. We're glad you're back. Yeah, we took a little break last week. It was our seven-year wedding anniversary, so we decided to give ourselves the weekend off. That was a nice little treat. And this week, Andrew has an amazing historical woman to oh, share with yes. us. Oh, yes. And also, if you observed uh, Easter, happy belated Easter as well. Yeah, happy belated Easter. Yes. Yeah, so... To end off like Women's History Month, I wanted to do a, a very special episode on one of my personal favorite um, ancient leaders, and she's a pharaoh. And I say she, because there's not very many female pharaohs in right. like the 3,000-year history, right? She's not the first, but there maybe it was one, max two before her. So she's still a very big deal. We had some of the patrons in yes. our Patreon guests, right? Yes. Who you were going to do this episode on? Absolutely. And what were some of the guesses? So some of the guesses were really good. I mean, you had the, the big three. Mm -hmm. There's Cleopatra, mm -hmm. right? Who's obviously the last pharaoh. And then you had Nefertiti, also a very good guess. But the first, or the, you know, the one remaining of the big three is Hatshepsut. Who, I think a few folks guessed her. She did, yes. Or she did. A few folks did guess her. Yeah. Um, so congratulations to those patrons who correctly guessed. Yeah. And if you join our Patreon, we do like give you kind of like a sneak peek into the upcoming content. And we love to engage with you all there. So if you're interested in joining our Patreon, you will find that information in the show notes. Absolutely. And the first 25 patrons were able to get this hat that I'm wearing right now. That's right. That's so right. I know some of us, some of you have already messaged us saying, Oh my God, I love this thing. So thank you. I designed it myself. I mean, obviously a lot of time and effort went into the design phase of it. Right. Right. <laughs> no, we're so glad that uh, the folks who've been getting the hats so far from our Patreon are liking them. Um, we don't have merch. So this is kind of like the exclusive, History for Weirdos merch, and we it was just a nice way to say thank you for supporting us and for believing in us and in this podcast. Yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks. So without further ado, let's just like get into the story of Hatshepsut, right? Yeah. Okay, so we're going to be going to the New Kingdom of Ancient Egypt, and this is in the Late Bronze Age, so around like the 15th century BC, the first half of that, to be slightly more specific, but... Not still very specific, I feel. <laughs> <laughs> so this was Hatshepsut. She was a queen who ruled over Egypt. And today is viewed as one of the most like interesting and alluring figures, I think, throughout all of the ancient world. Really? Yeah. And we'll get, don't worry, guys. We'll get into that. We'll get into it big time. So Pharaoh Hatshepsut. She would oversee one of the most incredible and arguably the most underrated construction project in the ancient world. Mm. Yeah, I, I love. I've obviously I've never been to Egypt, so I've never seen it in person. But this is on one of my short lists. Like I would see like Pyramid of Giza, mm -hmm. and then this next thing. Really, after. it's. I mean, it. I don't even understand how they could have built it. I'm like even to more hear so. What it is. Yeah, even more so than I think the uh, the Great Pyramid of Giza. Because, I mean, at the end of the day, it's like you stock blocks on top of each other. I mean, not that is not impressive, but, like, you know, other societies did that as well. This, the thing that she built was completely just out of left field Ooh, and unique. Very intriguing. Yeah, very intriguing. So, um, and also, like, she oversaw Egypt during its golden age. Mm. Like, the new age, or I'm sorry, new age, new kingdom Egypt was Egypt at its absolute height. Okay, that's good to know. Yeah. And we're going to go into the history of Egypt in a little bit just because I feel like I need to explain like how vast this history is. Um, it's ridiculously old, right? Like my favorite fact is that we live much closer in time to Cleopatra, the last pharaoh of Egypt, than she did to the first pharaoh of Egypt, Narmeh. Wow. Yeah. That's weird to think about. It's And it's by like a thousand years. 
you kind of think of them like all of Egyptian, like ancient Egyptian history, I, at least I do, happening within like a few hundred years. Right, exactly. That's so inaccurate. Absolutely. And I, I don't remember, it might have been Ramses II. He literally started Egyptology. I mean, in the ancient world, because to him, the first, second, third, you know, fourth, fifth dynasties were just like how we view like Julius Caesar. That's crazy. Yeah, like it was so far in the past. And that's the study of e- ancient Egypt is literally ancient in itself. That's, I know. That's a goal. trip. <laughs> that's, I know, right? So, and when Nameh rose to power, he's the first pharaoh of Egypt, right? This would have been like around like, I'm we're spitballing here, but like roughly 3100 BC. Um, and the, he didn't have, Egypt had none of the things that we associate with e- ancient Egypt. So mm. pyramids, they didn't exist. Obelisks, Obelisk. they didn't exist. Even mummies, mm. the way we think of them, didn't exist. Oh. Literally nothing. That's so interesting. Yeah. So, in fact, you know, it, we're just going to break down ancient Egyptian history because, again, like I said, I think it really gives a good kind of understanding of where we are in this timeline. So, the first part of ancient Egyptian history is pre-dynastic. So, this is before a unified Egypt. Mm-hmm. You did have what what we now call pharaohs, but that in itself is a new kingdom term. term. Okay. So, they wouldn't have called themselves that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hatshepsut would not have called herself a pharaoh. Very interesting. Yeah. So you had Upper Egypt, which is actually in the southern part of Egypt, and Lower Egypt, which is actually in the northern. Because the Nile, (laughs) yeah, the Nile flows north. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. So everything's turned around in Egypt. Because the Nile must have been such a center of life. Oh, you couldn't have said it better. Like, it was the center of life. I mean, literally, like, you know, growing grain to, like... You know, all Travel. social aspects were like mm-hmm. centered around the Nile, right? Mm-hmm. All the major Egyptian cities were kind of near uh, the Nile. The only one exception is Siwa, which wouldn't be founded until like the seventh century BC, so much later than this. Um, and again, uh, this was like pre thirty one hundred BC, so this is a long, long, long time ago. So Nama he um. He unifies the two kingdoms, and that's why we call him the first pharaohs, because he does that. Um, and it, we know nothing about him except there's this one really cool, like, steely, which hit, uh, shows him, like, almost, like, grabbing someone by their hair, and he's, like, about to, like, sp- hit him with a club. Oh, snap. Yeah, and that kind of goes to show, like, very militaristic. Yeah, that's what they appreciated. Exactly. That's what he's glorified for. Exactly. <laughs> Um, he and his immediate successors are referred to as like the first dynasty and the first dynasty and the second dynasty are what we call like early dynastic. We're not even in old kingdom Egypt yet. We're still in like early dynastic Egypt. Okay. Um, and the old kingdom, which comes right after starts off with this guy named, uh, Joser and he builds like the step pyramids. <laughs> Joser. Yeah. Joser <laughs> spelled with a D J O S E R. Wow. And yeah, like the the step pyramid in Saqqara mm-hmm. is like the first pyramid in the in the world. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and that kicks off like an entirely, well, I mean, it's all, remember, it's all retroactive, right? So it's not like at that time, they're like, oh, this is now the old kingdom, right? Yeah. It's how we ascribe um, history like to ourselves, really. And that, that step pyramid of Saqqara was instrumental, I think, in... And having pyramids kind of be like the main thing that pharaohs would build all throughout the old kingdom. Yes. Um, and pyramids are in vogue, again, like for pretty much all the old kingdom and even parts of the middle kingdom as well. Uh, but, I mean, we all know about it because of the greatest pyramid arguably ever built, Giza, right? Mm-hmm. It's, it, and that was under Pharaoh Khufu. It was pretty amazing. But... This is like kind of Egypt's first golden age, right? Like mm-hmm. things are like they still have war, but their wealth is built up pretty um, over time. Like Egypt becomes very rich. Mm-hmm. I think is the best way to put it. Eventually, that stops, and everything mm-hmm. kind of goes to shit. As it does. As it does, right? That's life. That's just life. <laughs> and yeah, centralized rule pretty much like falls away, and you have like what's called the first intermediary period, and it's just 
generalized instability. It's not a fun time to be Egyptian at this time. Generalized instability. I can't imagine what that feels like. What's that like? <laughs> I know. I feel like we're kind of nearing the end of a golden age and going into an intermediate period. Yay. Oh, yay. Anyways. <laughs> so eventually, though, the bad times come to an end and you have an ascension of a pharaoh named Menhutep. And he, like Namech, uh, he united Egypt. And again, like almost like roughly a thousand years after Namech did. That's crazy. Yeah. And so you have the beginning of the Middle Kingdom. Who would have guessed? Because it's in the middle. It's in the middle. And it's really sad. And it's very much so like the middle child. It gets forgotten. It gets forgotten big time. Aww. Because they don't have, like, the old kingdom had pyramids. The new kingdom had beautiful construction projects. Yeah. The middle kingdom actually has great literature, but that's just, to the casual observer of Egyptian history, that's just not as interesting. They also don't have mm. the crazy campaigns, the military campaigns that you'd have in the new kingdom, or I guess even in the old kingdom as well. So they're just chilling kind of <laughs> they're chilling that's, that's a good place to be it's not a bad yeah like you have the first piece of literature that probably comes from this period mm -hmm. like writing just for the sake of writing for the sake of telling a story mm -hmm. not necessarily tied to the gods or you know the deeds of some great king of the past just some dude like on a fishing trip do we have records of that we do yeah that's really interesting yeah so it's like a, a fiction story or it's a, a memoir? fiction story yeah okay I know, That's really cool. It's, it's considered like the first piece of literature. It's really neat. Yeah. So that's what kind of what Middle Egypt's all about, right? <laughs> but sadly, this period eventually ends, mm -hmm. and guess what happens? Instability. Not again. Who would have guessed? We were just there. So, Stephanie, do you care to venture what like this next period is called before the New Kingdom? What was the, the first, first one? one was called the first intermediate period. What do you think this one's called? Maybe, I don't know, the second intermediate period? <laughs> you got it. Yay! Oh my goodness. That's amazing. <laughs> so basically like the first one, everything kind of sucks. <laughs> Sorry guys, it's true. Uh, we don't have like a whole lot, except we do know one thing. The one difference is that they're actually Egypt is actually conquered by a foreign power. Mm. A very mysterious group of people called the Hyksos. And Ooh. the aftermath of that is actually important for Hatshepsut. So they'll tie in together. But it, it's a really strange group of people. They kind of took advantage of Egypt's internal weakening. They I, they conquer definitely lower Egypt and into parts of upper Egypt as well. Um, not a great time. That's, that's a, such a common pattern throughout history, right? One civilization is doing well they look over see another civilization floundering and they're like perfect yeah let's take over exactly let's invade and this would not be the last time that egypt is conquered by foreign power but it's the first and it's i think the the most scarring to their um to their psyche mm -hmm. to I, the egyptian I, identity maybe exactly mm -hmm. and that this is me just completely spitballing try to put myself in their shoes but yeah based off of later actions that we'll talk about i think it makes sense so between the years like 1570 to 1550 BC, the Hyksos are eventually driven from Egypt. Mm. And the country is unified once again by native Egyptians and the 18th dynasty of rules over the country. 18th already. Yeah, we're already at the 18th. I'm really doing, I'm trying to, I'm really trying to make this as fast as possible, but still give you the idea that a lot of stuff is, that has already happened with Egypt. Yeah. Like it's crazy. Like if, if the United States, let's just say, were to last as long as like pharaonic Egypt, we would still be in like the first or second dynasty, like early, 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 maybe I third. I don't know. Really? You think up to third? Yeah. The first two dynasties were pretty short. Oh, okay. So yeah, the, it could have been the third. Um, so we'd be getting our step pyramids. Oh, yeah. how cute. We don't have step pyramids right now. No. We, we do have... have a Bass Pro shop, though, that is in the shape of a pyramid. And it's one of the largest in the world, isn't it's it? It's one of the largest in the world. That's America right there. That's, that is literally <laughs> I, so quintessential America. It's ridiculous. So the 18th Dynasty, that's where our protagonist, Hatshepsut, comes into play. Yay. So like I said earlier, this is a golden age of Egyptian history, and you have some of the most memorable pharaohs mm. um, during the 18th uh, dynasty actually uh, and then and 18 19 to 20th i should say is one of them named ramses there's like 11 of them named ramses so i guess correctly you did yes <laughs> so you have like the thutmoses right um 
you have Akhenaten. He's the heretic king. <gasps> I love it. Or the heretic it. pharaoh. Yeah, he's he's might be the first monotheist in history. That we know of. That we know of. Yeah, yes. because he's in such a prominent position, it would be recorded. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I like the heretic pharaoh as a band name or a DJ name or an album name. That's a really interesting thought. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, I, I had to think about that. My wheel, the wheels in my head were turning. I was like, actually, that's really good. That's pretty much the summary of our marriage is Andrew's like, let me go on kind of like a semi-manic rampage about something ancient. And then I'm like, wait, but wouldn't that be like a sick band name? <laughs> that's and then, actually perfect. And then yeah. you're like, that's interesting. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, let me... Let me talk about Akhenaten. Yes. No, we're not going to talk about Akhenaten. I do find him fascinating, but his wife is Nefertiti. Oh, the babe. The babe. And then you have also Hatshepsut was, I, I've seen some modern reconstructions of what she could have looked like mm -hmm. when she was younger. She was very beautiful. I bet a lot of them were beautiful and that's not like that. That's all of Nefertiti's identity either, but that's just what she's known for even now. Like striking. Just being so beautiful. It's even, um, a cosmetic procedure that you can get is called a Nefertiti neck lift. Really? Yeah. That's it's, interesting. It's actually just like, not that I was looking into this, but it's just like Botox injections in your platysma muscles so that it's not like pulling your neck down so that your neck looks lifted because Nefertiti looked so sculpted. She did. Like just so beautiful. I think she was uh, mewing. She must have been mewing hard all yeah. the time. I told you this, the, we saw... <laughs> We were in art class in high school, and our teacher, Miss um, Diamant, hi, Miss Diamant, she put up a picture of Nefertiti on the projector. That's how old I am. And we all were like quiet for a second, and Miss Diamant was like, What? Because we're never quiet. And we're all like, That looks like Cassie. It looked like Cassandra, this girl in our class who was Egyptian. Wow. It looked so much like her. She was beautiful, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, and I was very jealous. My Leo moon was like, man, how come I don't look like an Egyptian? You might look like queen? a Celtic queen or something. I'll take it. I'll take it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll take it. Side tangent over. Side tangent over. Okay. Back to main quest. Main quest. Let's do it, guys. <laughs> so, oh, also Toot and Common or King Tut comes from this era mm -hmm. as well yeah so one New of the King, most well-known probably exactly and because his his uh his tomb was so well intact mm -hmm. like the you could see there's even a picture of the um the lock i guess technically it's just like a a really complex um like knot mm. and That's it was still intact like thousands of years later oh imagine seeing that in person oh i would have freaked out yeah. i probably would have cried Mm -hmm. I mean, to discover something like that magnificent is amazing. That's huge. So Egypt, again, it reached is its pinnacle during this time. And then boom, Bronze Age collapse. We've heard about the Bronze Age collapse. In fact, you can check out episode 101 after this if you want to know more. <laughs> so, but we're not going to go into it. Egypt from here on would never really fully recover. Like the golden mm -hmm. ages are behind, right? You still have... Uh, a ton of history from this yeah. point forward, like almost like, like basically a thousand years. Right. But they would have like sporadic resurgences of like some mm -hmm. like prominence. Right. Uh, and this would be mainly during what's called the late period, but they'd also be conquered by foreign powers like the Syrians, the Persians, and then finally Alexander the great, your guy, my boy. And it seems like in this latter period of, of this thousand years, the big appeal to foreign powers of Egypt is their history. Exactly. Right? right. It gives you such a source of legitimacy. Yeah. Because it's like, oh yeah, this is the land of pharaohs. Mm -hmm. Right now, by this time, pharaoh is actually a word. And it just gives you, again, like so much legitimacy. Mm -hmm. I don't know how else to put it. So, and then finally, like you get our, our the last dynasty, the Ptolemies, which is ironically the longest standing dynasty in Egyptian history. And the, ickiest in the ickiest you know. <laughs> well i mean there there's some ickiness before them we'll even talk about some of the ickiness great <laughs> so <laughs> and then finally the last pharaoh would be cleopatra and yes that cleopatra that one that one i think the seventh 
I'm not sure. Oh yeah, you're right. She has, she's technically Cleopatra the seventh, I believe. I'm I'm not sure on the number, but it's not important. Ooh, we're gonna get called out in some comments that we don't know <laughs> <laughs> what number she was. I know we're totally gonna get called out. Oh, it's okay, guys. You know, none we of us are perfect. We can't be perfect. We no, just can't. I, trust me, I really can't. The perfect is the enemy of the good. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so by the end of Cleopatra's reign, you know, Rome t- uh, makes Egypt a province. Um, yeah. It's literally like Augustus's personal property. It's insane. And I, again, he's like, this is cool because I am now a part of this like ancient dynasty that is Egypt, right? Exactly. Like, Romans it, loved Egypt. Oh, oh yeah, and even to the point where they loved being portrayed as pharaohs, right? Yeah. So there's even like a, a relief of Trajan much later as a pharaoh mm-hmm. of Egypt. So the pharaohs though eventually like come to an end and it's 3000 years of history. 3000 wow. years, guys. That's insane. Um that's it. That's all the backstory. I know that was quite a bit, but I just really wanted to give you weirdos like a bit of perspective of how insanely long Egyptian history is. Yeah, that was some good perspective. Thank you. So now we're going to the real story. We're going to go back to Hatshepsut during mm-hmm. her life. Um, she was born at the end of the 16th century BC. So still quite a bit, long, you know, quite a bit back, right? Mm-hmm. This was around 1507. And she was the daughter of Thutmose the first. Mm. So, Thutmose being a pharaoh. Oh, okay. Yeah, so she was the daughter of a pharaoh. Mm -hmm. So she was literally born into royalty, right? Um, And she really is in the royal family because when she's about 12 years old, her dad dies, and she marries her half-brother, Thutmose II. I knew it was going there. Yeah. Why do royal families do that? So not only (laughs) she's marrying her half-brother, She's She's 12. She's 12. To be fair, he was around the same age, but still. Yeah, I'm sure he's probably like, what, 14, 13. But that's icky for all the kids involved. And they do have a kid together. Oh, my God. (laughs) If you want to see how grossed out my face is, join our Patreon (laughs) so you can watch the video. (laughs) That's an incredible (laughs) plug. Oh, my God. Because this is so gross. It's really disgusting. (laughs) Um, Yeah, but the Egyptian royals sometimes really like to keep in the family, if you know what I mean. Mm-mm. So they would remain married for the next 12 to 13 years or so up until around 1479 BC when Thutmose II would unexpectedly die. He was actually around our age when he died. Oh, wow. That yeah, is young. Around the age of Alexander. Ooh. Ooh auspicious. So in this puts... Not auspicious. <laughs> yeah, I know. Not auspicious <laughs> at all, actually. But I just like to make things up like that. Okay, so this puts things in an awkward place. Mm-hmm. Um, you see how Chefsuit might have been the queen and even the main royal wife, but Egyptian pharaohs typically had multiple wives, right? They'd have their main wife, but then they'd have their side wives. I know what you were going to say. Yeah, I, I saw myself. <laughs> so, and Thutmose had a young son with one of his other wives, uh, and he would ironically also be a Thutmose. He'd be Thutmose the third. That's really surprising. Yeah. I'm shocked. And he would be <laughs> crowned as the next pharaoh. But the only problem with that is that he's two years old at this point. He's literally a infant child. Yeah. He, he can't be pharaoh. He cannot be pharaoh. So Hatshepsut would not only have to be a stepmom slash aunt to a young Thutmose the third, she would also have to serve as the queen regent to him. Wow. So at this point, she's not a pharaoh. Right? Yeah, Queen Regent, different. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And she's only ruling on behalf of her stepson slash nephew. So Ugh, gross. I know. I wonder if she cared that, like, if there was any jealousy there ever. Or if she was like, yeah, I don't, like, it's kind of gross that I'm married to my brother, so I don't care. I, th- <laughs> I think that. She yeah. was a very intelligent person, and I think she she just understood the game. Yeah. For lack of a better term. There was probably no ego of like, oh, I hate this kid because he's you know, from his other wife type of thing. I actually got the sense that she was quite a good stepmom. Oh, so that Yay. I know it really, I was like, you know, that's really nice. Stepmom slash aunt. Maybe that's why it's yeah, her blood. Maybe. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And it seemed like her marriage to her husband also, again, we don't have a ton of records, right? We don't, you don't have historians at this point, like writing about it. So mm-hmm. it's kind of all guessing guesswork, like educated guesswork, but it seems that, they were pretty happy 
at the very least. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, it's gross, right? It's icky. Look at this face that I'm going to make. Gross. It's a good face. Um, <laughs> but they must have been raised with this idea being normalized in the home to a certain extent. Absolutely. So this wouldn't have been like a big shocking traumatic thing for them they're like oh great now we get to maintain power in our family and this is like kind of what we were born to do right and they're rulers at Mm -hmm. the end of the day like there are there are certain things that you just have to give up when you become a ruler and that's one of them like you know and so it sounds like they got along it did because being siblings obviously doesn't guarantee that cleopatra killed her brother husband right um but it seems like they got along and they ruled well together until he died yes exactly So, and it's really interesting because it's thought that that during this first couple of years uh, in her rule as queen regents, she led a quick expedition against the kingdom of Kush in the south of Egypt, which is interesting because we talked about Kush, though, later on. We did, yeah. um, During an episode on someone that I'm literally blinking on right now, and it was my episode. Did it not come up in your... Oh, Kandake. Yeah. Yeah, Kandake. Yeah. Very interesting. And did it not come up in the episode that you did on the history of cannabis? That was actually really funny, but no, I don't think so. Because of the name? Yeah, because of the name. Yeah. No, I I knew we were coming with that. No, with cannabis, it comes more from like Central Asia. Yeah. But I was wondering if the name was, because we call it that. So I wonder if it was connected somehow. Yeah. I don't. To Kush's history. I don't know. I I, I can't remember, but it might just be a. A coincidence, honestly. What a shame. I'm really know. disappointed in you. <laughs> <laughs> this makes me question everything. Everything. Question everything. <laughs> okay. Going back to the story here. So she leads this expedition against the kingdom of Kush, right, in the south of Egypt. It's hardly unprecedented as pharaohs would typically lead military expeditions south into Kush and Nubia uh, because they just wanted to beat up on their smaller neighbors. <laughs> Um, I mean, it serves a, a political purpose that like, hey, we can lead armies. We're cool. Also, <laughs> we're, they probably, they raided, right? They took a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Uh, livestock, gold, enslaved other riches, people. enslaved, yeah, enslaved folks. So, you know, it's profitable as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, so even though she's not a pharaoh yet, uh, she probably led this expedition thinking that this could further legitimize her in the future. Yes, it makes her look good. And it's mm-hmm. really interesting. I, I, I have this later in my notes, but I want to bring it up now. It's She's always described as this pacifist queen, and I don't necessarily agree with that. It doesn't like, sound very pacifist. I, I just think that there isn't a lot of evidence for her campaigns, but I do think they did happen. Yeah. Uh, But I mean, it doesn't sound like she's a pacifist. No, no. And we'll go on later on um, because it seemed like Thutmose III uh, during her reign, he was the one that was more in charge of like the military, Mm -hmm. which makes sense, right? He's like growing up. You have like, you know, trained for that. Exactly. You Mm -hmm. have a a stepmom slash aunt that is kind of handling a lot of like the domestic responsibilities of the empire, right? Because Egypt at this point pretty much is an empire. Um, and you can really just focus on the military and be like the man when it comes to leading, you know, expeditions against foreign, uh, you know, foreign countries. Mm-hmm. So it, it, it seems like it's a really beneficial relationship. Yeah. But at the same time, I don't think that, you know, Hatshepsut was just like stood by and wasn't involved in military affairs. I feel like that's a really silly like early 20th century uh look at her yes it's a very patriarchal view of women right of like oh yeah she was ruling but she must have not been ruling like a man would have (laughs) it's funny you say that because Mm -hmm. i'm not even joking 100 years ago egyptologists literally thought like that yeah like i we're joking but that's that was the original consensus but obviously to serve not like to survive to be successful she would have had to she also sounds very shrewd i feel like it's a little bit of an insult to her intelligence and capabilities that she would have completely overlooked the military part of her duties you are spot on hmm. we'll we'll Thank talk you. more about it later i'm i'm i don't want to get into it too much okay okay tell us more but about 6 years into her reign something extraordinary did happen right 
um, Hatshepsut had already been referring to herself as, you know, quote unquote, the lady of the two lands by this point. So she was positioning herself well for power. But what is incredible is that she declared herself Pharaoh mm. in like around either 1473 or 1472 BC. Now, again, like I mentioned, there had been one, maybe two pharaohs before in the past, before mm-hmm. her. But they arose when Egypt was in shambles and the power behind the pharaoh was not particularly strong. You mean female pharaohs? Female pharaohs. Sorry. Yes. Thank mm-hmm. you. So it's not unprecedented, but it's unprecedented in a time of this prosperity. Yeah. Everyone's like, oh, everything's good. We're not desperate. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So again... This is not the case with Hatshepsut. Like Egypt was on an upward trajectory and would continue to be on an upward trajectory for uh, centuries wow. at this point. That's crazy. And we know she was a popular ruler because in order to pull off this move, mm-hmm. she would have had to have a large and diverse support and power base. So from nobles to priests to the army. Yeah. All of them, or at least key players in each of those groups, would have had to support her. Yeah. And they did. So Hatshepsut did surround herself with supporters in key positions of government, including a man by the name of Senenmut. And he, he was her chief uh, administer, like minister, I guess, mm-hmm. and possible lover. Oh, okay. We're not 100% sure on that. He did have 25 monuments made to himself. Oh. So he's okay. a non-royal who has 25 monuments <laughs> to himself, at, at the very least. I have a feeling... You get that way by sleeping with the person in charge. Exactly. That's how you could get 25 monuments to yourself. That's why I'm like, yeah, they probably were lovers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and um, again, like that's absolute, that's insane for most pharaohs. I think previous to this point, that would be absurd for a non-royal. Wow. Like absolutely absurd. He sounds a little egotistical. I'm going to say it. <laughs> Slightly. Yeah. But speak- I will give him credit. It's because of him that we know a little bit more about Hatshepsut from his own tomb actually very interesting yeah and he mentioned multi actually in the tomb he mentions multiple times on and also on monuments as well that he was a quote unquote true confidant of the pharaoh and Mm. the one whose utterances his lord relied wow he's really trying to tell you without telling you he's like guys yeah read between the lines here (laughs) (laughs) so that's my girl that's my girl (laughs) exactly so, although I mentioned a military expedition to Kush, the reign of Hatshepsut was still mainly peaceful. Again, I, you know, we talked about earlier about how I think she's more militaristic than we give her credit for, but at the same time, there wasn't a lot of wars that were happening during her 20 plus year reign. That's nice. Yeah. The reason being is that a military leader was, t- was reserved exclusively for men. Although, like, this isn't really well understood because there are literal depictions of her leading troops in battle. So it's like, that is, those directly contradict each other. Yeah. Even if it were just symbolic, those depictions, that doesn't make sense. Why would you symbolically do that if that's not her role? Right. That's weird. And it's really interesting because it's around this time and for the rest of her time as a pharaoh mm-hmm. that she st- had herself stylized in the more tradition masculine pharaoh-like manner in reliefs and statues. Mm. So she was and this and it's I very clear cool. that this is not a case of like oh um you know she identifies as a man or anything like that. It is 100% like a political move. Yes. To, she's yes. trying to al- she's trying to look like a man in the sense that that equals strength, that equals legitimacy, that equals I deserve this title. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. And also it helps that her father was literally a Pharaoh. Her husband was literally a Pharaoh. She's the regent to a Pharaoh, you know? Yeah. So she's like, I'm a Pharaoh. I'm, I'm a Pharaoh basically. Le Pharaoh c'est moi. Exactly. (laughs) It's totally wrong. (laughs) So she like during her, like in these, and these reliefs, it's actually quite funny. Like she gives herself a beard and she gives herself like, she's really jacked. She was like, <laughs> if you're going to make me a man, you better make me jacked as hell. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's pretty, I love that. That's pretty much what she did. She was like, I, guys, I hit the weights like seven days a week, every day, all day. You know what that reminds me of? 
um, in the later seasons of Game of Thrones, Cersei, once her children have passed, she no longer wears those like flowy dresses. Right. She wears basically like a knight's clothing and a lot of like metal and black clothing. She dresses a lot like her dad. Yeah. If anything. Very masculine. Yeah. Yeah. And she has more like angle. She has the short, short hair. hair like, yeah. 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 But that is interesting. I, I never really drew that parallel. She's also really showing herself as the ruler of Westeros. Yes. That's, that's a really good parallel. Yeah, I never thought about you. that. So back to Hatshepsut, early Egyptologists, like in the late 19th century, early 20th centuries, thought her ascension to being like a pharaoh was just a naked power grab. But, and I am of this, uh, this later um, kind of theory. Mm-hmm is that it's actually more that there could have probably was is some sort of political crisis around this time. Oh, okay. And that we don't really know anything about because um, that it, it would make sense that the, if around this point in time, there was a rival claim from like a competing uh, branch of the Royal family mm-hmm. that she would step into this role. Yeah. To protect to protect it, yeah. Right, and because you look what happens, like, she doesn't do this immediately. She do- When she does do this, like, it's not like Thutmose Third is put into some sort of, like, prison, mm-hmm. right, when he's a little kid. No, he is just still doing what he was doing before. She's trying to protect her family. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And I think it was definitely, um, I think her becoming and, like, grabbing this power alongside her stepson was, ironically, I think, protecting him. Mm. not taking power away from him. Mm -hmm. So this does make Hatshepsut the co-pharaoh with Thutmose III for the rest of her life. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. And again, like if she truly was a usurper, like none of this would make sense. Yeah. I don't know. I truly don't think she was. You could get rid of a kid. Quite easily. And it, it did happen. Yeah. Like, but the fact that she didn't, and it's also important because that was the third would actually be one of the most important pharaohs mm. of the new kingdom as well. We're not going to get into it. He was much more militaristic. Mm-hmm. Obviously, that was his focus during <laughs> Shepsut's reign. Which she kind of allowed him to focus on. Exactly. Yeah. I think it was actually quite intelligent. It's kind of like you, you see a later parallel um, during the reign of Marcus Aurelius when he has his uh, first his brother, um, Lucius Verus, as a co-emperor. That's right. Yeah. And Lucius Verus is like the guy that's like, okay, I'm on campaigns in the East. Mm-hmm. He's really good at like the military, not really good at anything else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, partying. He's really good at partying. There you go. So, and then Marcus really is like, I'll do everything else. Yeah. That's kind of, I think that's kind of like what's happening here. There's someone who's clearly more of like the senior role mm-hmm. and then someone who's more in the subordinate role. And I do think Hatshepsut obviously isn't then the more senior role. Yeah. So, what Pet Shepsut, though, was really known for during her reign was her public works program, as well as the, the trade expeditions that were carried out. That's cool. Yeah. So during the Second Intermediate Period, right, I mentioned the Hyksos. They conquered Egypt, um, and they really just messed things up. I don't know how else to put it. The country was just in disarray because of them. Um, they sacked temples. They just like, they didn't do anything to improve mm-hmm. anything. <laughs> I, got, I know that's so, uh, my words there are really eloquent. I know, but they just didn't do anything good. Yeah. That's, that's really similar to a lot of more modern historical conquests where it's just yeah. like, oh, you just went there to like mess stuff up. Yeah. Extract take. resources. Yeah, you just wanted to take, you didn't actually want to contribute. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things that were messed up during this time was something that's a little bit more nuanced, right? Like trade networks. That's not something that you can just build, right? Mm -hmm. That is something that you need to, you need to really organize. And that takes a a huge effort from a diverse group of people. Yeah. Right. In different countries. And that's one of the things she did was establish those, those trade networks. So this allows wealth to flow back into Egypt again. That's amazing. Yeah, it's really important for not only her own legitimacy, but for just the everyday people of Egypt. Yeah. So, for example, like good lumber 
That comes from Canaan or modern day Lebanon. Tin comes from present day Afghanistan. Copper and turquoise come from the Sinai Peninsula. Mm. And different incenses um, come from like the south, southeast in modern day Ethiopia and Somalia. Mm-hmm. Right. And she established trade networks with all those different regions. Yeah. And especially like you might be like tin what's that important it's very important for making bronze and along with copper you need those two metals uh to make like you know it's called the bronze age right like weapons were made of bronze armor was made of bronze Mm -hmm. even just like hammers sometimes were made of bronze right tools yeah yeah it's very important so the apex of re-establishing these trade networks though was an expedition to the land of punt or punt near modern day Somalia, we think, in the ninth year of her reign. So like around circa like 1470 BC. And so Punt means the divine land Mm. and was chock full of items that would be considered fantastic and exotic to the ancient Egyptians. So you had mirror, frankincense, gold, ebony, ivory, and even panther skins. Wow. All really cool stuff for the Egyptians. So, I mean, pretty cool stuff here, except for the panther skins. I don't like that. Yeah oh oh and the the ivory never mind yeah i don't like that yeah either. yeah i forgot where ivory comes from as well <laughs> i know but so. the frankincense um and myrrh that's what jesus got from the three kings yes exactly interesting yeah and so this expedition was headed by one of Hatshepsut's chief lieutenants a guy by the name neshi who literally we don't the only thing we know about this guy is that he did this expedition and his name was neshi yeah (laughs) so he brought back like a huge amount of items um all the things i've mentioned including most famously a couple dozen live myrrh trees wow live trees live trees that could not have been easy to transport yeah which are huge by the way they had these giant baskets that they'd have to put them in oh my gosh yeah and there was like yeah dozens that they brought back. It was pretty impressive. Also, what makes this trip such a huge deal is that this is the first time that Egyptians had been to the land of Punt in 500 plus years. Oh my gosh. Yeah. They were totally cut off from there. Totally cut off. Yeah. The last time that anyone from Egypt was there was around like 2000 BC. Okay. So kind of a big deal. And, you know, trading would continue between the two nations for centuries to come. So that was a really important trade route. Also, kind of fun fact i think i think it's the frankincense hatshepsut was the first person to use that as an eyeliner oh interesting yeah kind of cool fun fact so shortly after this uh, successful mission hatshepsut also sent raiding parties against the city of biblos and in just the sinai peninsula in general Mm -hmm. because she's like you know Got to send the military. Got to keep them on their toes, I guess. <laughs> Why not? It seems like Egypt was like very much so. And I know this later on, like they were a dominant power, like of their region and pretty much maybe even like of the entire Mediterranean world. So you think it's kind of like serves the purpose of reaffirming your dominance? Exactly. A hundred percent. Also, it's like free, not free, but like you get a lot of things in return, mm-hmm. right? Booty and you know, enslaved folks. Mm-hmm. So... It could have been also used to send um, like a political message, Mm. but you know, the circumstances behind these expeditions are completely lost to us. Regardless though, Hatshepsut was incredibly gifted in getting people to follow her. That's a very good skill. Yeah. That's a very, very good skill. And here's a really interesting note about her. Right. And again, like she's often described as this pacifist, but I have to say it again. It is like, I don't necessarily agree with that. Like, I'm not saying that she is, like, war-hungry or mm-hmm. anything like that, but, like, she's not she's not afraid to of a fight. Let's just say that. Yeah. And there's even a depiction of her, I believe, in the actual tomb of Senemut that has her leading an army, right? Like, her specifically. Not like, oh, like, there's an army under her. No, no, she's leading an army. That doesn't sound like a pacifist. No, it's not. <laughs> it's very much so in the kind of the limelight of of Name, you know? Mm-hmm. Very yes. much so, like, against, you know, she's really comparing herself against, like, the very ancient Egyptians. Mm-hmm. So whether this was later propaganda or an accurate description of actual events is not entirely clear, but at the very least, um, I don't think Hatshepsut would view herself as a pacifist. That's important. I think that is 
like based off of all this evidence, I think that is pretty clear. Mm-hmm. I think it's, a, it's pretty easy to surmise that. So let's talk about her biggest legacy though. Yeah. Big ass buildings. Big buildings. Tell us more. <laughs> yeah. I'm so sorry guys. I was so crass, but I just, <laughs> <laughs> it's just kind of funny. Cause like that is really what she's known for. Big buildings. Big buildings. So she's easily in the top 10, probably the top five pharaohs when it comes to construction projects. It's wild. So first of all, especially, you know, knowing that pharaohs ruled Egypt for like 3,000 years. Yes, and they're known for building things. Yeah. <laughs> so first of all, the largest obelisk still in Egypt was built during the reign of Hatshepsut, which is around like 100 feet tall and is about or 30 and a half meters tall for... Wow. Uh, yeah. For our non-American folks. Um, it is one of like the two massive obelisks at the great temple complex at Karnak that still stand actually. The other one, I believe, was either built... I think it was built by her father, Thutmose the first. That's a big obelisk. Yeah, giant. And release commemorating the construction show the obelisk each... Like, the obelisk weighing about 450 tons and being towed along the Nile by 27 ships manned by 850 oarsmen. Yeah, there's no heavy machinery to lug those things around. Right, it is incredible logistic feat and also it's really interesting because of her um we know a little bit of ancient building or ancient egyptian building techniques because of one of her failed projects see there's a purpose to failure yeah there really is so there is an and you can still visit this obelisk to this day um there was an obelisk that they were digging out of bedrock near aswan that cracked and was abandoned Mm. and it would have it would have been the absolute like largest obelisk I think ever. Wow. Um, I think some records still count it, mm-hmm. but it was never, it was it, never erected. It's, yeah. It's still attached to the bedrock. Mm-hmm. So I think that's a little silly. Um, it would have weighed like almost 1100 tons mm-hmm. and would have been around either like, like roughly like 137 feet or around 42 meters. Oh my goodness. Yeah. And it's really interesting because you can see scooping marks mm. like when they were building it, like almost like when you're scooping out ice cream and you see. Yeah, that's what I pictured. Yeah. Like that's what it looks like. But in rock and you're like, how did they do that? How would you scoop rock? Yeah. Because I mean, normally rock is like chiseled away, right? You crack right, it. Like you go. And that's not the marks that are made. It's very smooth. That's very interesting. And I feel like it gives us some insights, but almost gives us more questions. Yeah. Um, it's really interesting. And weirdos, if any of you are like Egyptologists that are listening to this and you have, or if if you just have any inkling into how this was being made, let us know. So it's like smooth and like a crescent almost. Yeah. Like almost if you were to like, if you're in sand also and you're building something and you're kind of like just scooping like that, that's Mm -hmm. what it looks like. That's so, I really can't picture what would have done that. (laughs) What could have created a scooping into a rock? Maybe they had little scoopers back in the day. Scoop, scoop, scoop. Like um, <laughs> when the ice cream's too cold, yes. and you have to run it under warm water. Maybe yeah. they did something like that. Maybe they ran the scoopers under really warm water. Oh, they don't have running water. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> See, weirdos, we need to hear from you. Tell us, yeah. what do you think created the scoops? Neither of us are engineers, so we'll listen to you guys. We're really not. Not even a little bit. <laughs> so her major construction projects, though, they took place all over Egypt. Um Remember the Hyksos, those guys? Again, remember, they messed up a lot of Egyptian art and buildings. Not cool. And a lot of her time was to um, remedy that, right? Was to was to rebuild and to remake those artifacts that were either like crumbling or were just lost in general. That would also look really good to the people. Yeah, exactly. Kind and of the, restoring the glory. I mean, and this was like like um, re- restoration of like certain precincts at Karnak. Mm. This was also like the construction of the red chapel at Karnak as well. And then um, another temple at Beni Hassan. Mm. So very and like important things that, that meant a lot to the people. So in fact, so many statues were commissioned during her reign mm-hmm. that Almost every single museum in the world today that features Egyptian artifacts contains something from her era. That's wild. That's how much was built, guys. That's, That's a insane. Ton. It, 
Oh my goodness. I think at the Met in New York, there is an entire room dedicated just to Hatshepsut in her reign. Wow. That's so interesting because I don't know if this is just me, but I feel like at least our experience so far here in California, the U.S., things like that, I feel like leaders don't focus on infrastructure as much. No. But infrastructure does really, it impacts the everyday person. Yeah. So I think that is such a wise investment. It's not sexy, I guess, but it's no. it helps better ev- an everyday life. I know. It's really annoying because if it's like the federal government should really only be involved in like five things. It's like the military, the like the judicial system, infrastructure, um, education, and maybe like one more. Like Social safety nets. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, social safety net. Yeah, exactly. So it should really only be those things, but... Anyways, I I could, (laughs) trust me, I could go on a diatribe on that. I'm not going to. In California, we do not have great infrastructure, especially Southern California. No, we do not. No, we do not. Something we could use. We could use a Hepshet suit right now. Yeah, we really could, actually. Yeah. We really could. (laughs) Bring her back. Bring her back. But anyways, um, like what I've mentioned before, or just mentioned now, these are some of the more like noteworthy additions. There's so many to like to list that I can't even. Um, but I, I instead just want to kind of move on and and talk about the apex, the uh, her magnus opus. Tell us, magnum opus, magnum opus, magnum opus. Yeah, I, as soon as I said that, I was like, that was wrong. So this is the was now known as her mortuary temple complex at Deir el Bahri, and it's easily one of the most impressive buildings ever created, in my opinion, of all time. And just let alone from the ancient world. In her lifetime, it would have been called Jezer Jezeru, mm. meaning the Holy of Holies in kind of mm. in Middle Egyptian. I like that. So words are really hard to describe it. So like, I'll also include pictures of it on our, the Instagram post for this episode. But it's literally carved in a mountain. Like... A giant building carved into a mountain, like the Persians I know later. What you're talking about, yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. I didn't realize that was her tomb. It's not her tomb, actually. It's her mortuary temple. She has a tomb, but it's in the Valley of the Kings. It's what's, right next to it. What's the difference between a mortuary temple and a tomb? Oh, I've. Oh, probably the mortuary temple is more public, and her tomb is private. Oh, okay. Yeah. And the tomb is where her actual body is. Her body was never here. But the mortuary temple is just to like honor her. Yeah. It's like to honor her and the gods and all that stuff. Okay. Even her father, you know, okay. is a lot more. It's like a mausoleum almost, but public. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. So it's a, it was a three terraced, like gigantic building. Again, like I said, all carved into a mountain. It's three stories tall, connected by just a bunch of ramps and terraces that are really long. They're really long. And in its heyday, it contained shrines, chapels, and the sanctuary of Amun, which is kind of like their chief deity, one of their chief deities. That's pretty. Amun. And these were all woven together with like carved reliefs, reflecting pools, elaborate gardens, and just a bunch of exotic plants and trees. That's wild. Like none of those exist to this day, but it would, in its heyday, it would have been unbelievable. Magnificent, it sounds like. Magnificent. I mean, it was a party. Would this have been open to the public? I think so. Um, I'm not entirely sure, though. That's okay. I won't judge. It seems, <laughs> though, because there's a lot of propaganda of hers. Mm, so it would make sense, mm-hmm. I feel like. But again, there was propaganda in tombs as well. So That's true. That's true. Who but knows? You would, it would make sense if it was because you'd want people to associate you with like this big, magnificent structure. Exactly. I'm, I'm sure it was. I mean, it's huge. So I feel like it would be... If it wasn't to the public, it would be to like most, like you know the the royalty or the not the nobility. The nobility, thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the priests. I'm sure the priests had access. Mm-hmm. Um, now we could do an entire episode on the priestly class of Egypt. They they ex- wielded extraordinary power. But anyways, um, the construction of the temple was overseen by her chief steward Senemu. We know him. We know him. I've seen a few of his statues around. <laughs> Yeah, only 25 of them. <laughs> and it took around 15 years to complete. Oh, wow. That's a, For that level of beauty, though, that's not that long. Right. Like, and how long is it going to take LA to finish the metro line? Oh, yeah, way longer. <laughs> I mean, also, I don't think they were dealing with the level of corruption that we were dealing with here. 
<laughs> That's true. Yeah. They they had a little more uh, streamlined power. They did. <laughs> and also, I will mention, too, we have this notion that everything was built by slaves. And sure, slave yeah. labor was used, but there are, it's actually not the majority. The majority mm. are skilled artisans who are getting paid to build this because they have skills that are rare and unique. Yeah. So it's craftsmen. It's mm-hmm. yeah. The craftsmen are mainly used to build this because I mean, it is, it, it's extraordinary. It's, I'm glad you said that. I would have assumed it was slaves. Yeah, no, it's they're building the labor market in Egypt. was far more complex than I think we give it credit for. So, um, and it's because of this temple that we actually even know about her expedition to Punt. Um, as it's, there is a painted low relief sequence detailing all the events that happened. Or at least some sort of, some level, you know, propaganda or actual events. Who knows? It's very helpful, though. Yeah, very helpful. Um, it was beautiful. It was an architectural marvel. I mean, it still is. And also had the unintended effect of basically making, like, the Valley of Kings the final resting place of New Kingdom pharaohs. Because mm-hmm. remember, this is, the Valley of Kings wasn't really used until the New Kingdom. Okay. All the Middle Kingdom and and, and before pharaohs were you know, the old kingdom pharaohs were built or, you know, buried underneath their pyramids. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and then new king or middle kingdom, who, who knows, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> They're the middle. <laughs> They're the middle. <laughs> who, who cares? And then, yeah, the, uh, the Valley of Kings though was, was used for the new kingdom pharaohs. Very interesting. Again, like I'm, I'm simplifying, but that generally that's true. So, um, Hatshepsut was, again, not the first pharaoh to be buried here, but her mortuary temple certainly gives like an air of prestige and legitimacy, like not only for herself, but for future pharaohs. They want to be associated with this building that's kind of just like on the other side of the valley. Makes sense. Um, and it's also kind of ironic, and we'll get to that in a second as well. Um, her mortuary temple, though, it was completely a, a stark contrast from the earlier Egyptian um, major construction projects, right? They are known for a very blocky, mm. um, grand uh, buildings, right? Like mm-hmm. the pyramids. That's the one thing you can think of, especially at the top of your head. Um, but this wasn't that. This was much more sleek, had like columns. Uh, I think it had a colonnade, which is pretty, you know, ancient Greece doesn't even exist yet. So really interesting um, architecture here and completely different than anything had, that had been seen in Egypt. Wow. So Hatshepsut, she'd finally die uh, a little young, actually, around the age of 50. Mm, that is young. And she was, you know, she had ruled Egypt for just under, I think, 22 years. That's really cool. So kind of a long time. So she left Egypt in a very good position. She'd established trade networks, um, had sent, you know, minor punitive expeditions to get outside wealth flowing into the country. She had these grand building projects that were beautiful and employed thousands of people, right? There didn't seem to be any bad blood between her and Thutmose the third, right? It seemed like she was actually quite a good stepmother. So it might be interesting to know that after her death, Hatshepsut fell victim to a phenomenon called damnatio memore. Oh, did they get rid of her memory? Like the images of her? Yes. Um, in this case, in her case specifically, uh, th- it was through the form of destroying mentions of her name, depictions, and or defacing statues and monuments that were dedicated to her. What? Yes. Very interesting. Um, and this also happened decades after her death. This was not immediate. What? decades so it's after not her like death. oh we didn't know her stepson had like the secret grudge against her and as soon as he came into power he did that exactly and we know for a fact that's not the case that's so weird decades later decades later so initially egyptologists like 100 years ago right that was their that's what they surmised mm-hmm. they were all wrong about a lot of stuff yeah. we shouldn't give them we shouldn't be too harsh on them it's because of them that we even know these things but at the same time, they were very wrong. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, th- most of the third must have really hated his stepmother, right? She's the evil, wicked stepmother. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's no evidence of this. Yeah, he would have done that immediately then. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's what I think, too. Um, and yeah, again, like I don't, there's no evidence of any malice. And like you said, the timing doesn't work. Mm-hmm. However, it is interesting to note that at the end of Thutmose the Third reign, his son Amenhotep the Second became co-regent alongside the aging king. Okay. 
and it gets a little hazy with kind of family lineage, but it's possible that Amenhotep's claim to the throne could be challenged from maybe one of Hatshepsut's heirs oh. from, cause she had a daughter that maybe had a son. Yeah. And who could have challenged him? Exactly. Who knows? Right. Um, regardless of the motivations or who even did it, right? Because I don't think it was that was the third. I, I do think it was probably led by Amenhotep. He wanted to delegitimize her. Exactly. Interesting. I know, very strange. And the effort more or less worked, though. I mean, Hatshepsut was largely forgotten for thousands of years, which is hard for us to to uh, like recognize that, I guess, mm -hmm. because it's like she, when you think of like female pharaohs, especially like she's one of them. Mm -hmm. She's one of the, the main three that you think of. So we're going to take a massive leap forward. We're going to go all the way from the 15th century BC to 1822. Mm -hmm. So giant leap forward. Um, because of the Rosetta stone that had been discovered about like a couple decades, even before this, Archaeologists were finally able to decode some of the hieroglyphs on the walls of her mortuary temple. Oh, that's so cool. Yes. And it wasn't until 1903, though, that British archaeologist Howard Carter discovered Hatshepsut's sarcophagus. But it was empty. Oh. Huh? Don't worry, though, because we eventually discovered her tomb. Or, oh. I'm sorry, like the tomb oh. where she was buried. Yeah. So we discovered her tomb, but she wasn't. In she was moved subsequently. Okay. Like, she was moved around a couple times. I wonder why. Yeah, again, it's kind of like we think it has some sort of political yeah. affiliation, but w the exact circumstances are completely lost. So weird. It's kind of why I love ancient history because it doesn't even feel like history sometimes. It just feels like sci-fi. Mm -hmm. It's so weird. Mm -hmm. Almost like myth. Yeah. Exactly. So in I, I jumped ahead a little bit because two female mummies were found eventually in a tomb that all of the, the Valley of the Kings, they're designated by two letters and numbers. So the tomb she was found in was KV60, mm -hmm. so King Valley 60, mm -hmm. so the 60th tomb found there. And there was one, so two female mummies. One was thought, was pretty much like confirmed very early on that it was Hatshepsut's nurse, Sitra, as her name was inscribed on the sarcophagus. Okay, that's so a good like, guess. Okay. Okay. Um, while the other mummy, though, was thought to be Hatshepsut, but we weren't really sure at first. Now, all the way in 2007, so we're in 2007 now, Egyptian archaeologist Zahi Hawass concludes that the mummy is indeed Hatshepsut. Yay! CT scans show that the mummy mm -hmm. was missing a molar with, like, a broken root remaining in the jaw, and a tooth that had been found in the canopic jar, right? You know what those are. Yeah. Um... Weird as if you don't know what those are, those are the jars that they would put organs in. Yeah. Uh, of the when mummies. they were doing the mummification process. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a canopic jar with that tooth that had Hatshepsut's name and it matched perfectly in the mummy's jaw. How funny to think of a mummy getting a CT scan. I know. It's so weird. <laughs> like, <laughs> turns out she's dead. Yeah. Well, who would have known? <laughs> you like look at this crusty mummy. Yeah. You're like... Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. If you ever need to identify my remains, the ladies listening know why this thought came to mind. I don't need to explain myself. I know why this thought came to mind. I'm married to you, <laughs> but that's why. Remember that I had a root canal, and so I have my one of my molars is fake. Yes, I did know that. It's a little cap. Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Yeah, if they have my dental, you can tell them that. Yes. So there's still like some, <laughs> you're like, just like, like yes. moving on. <laughs> so there's some scientific debate on um, like if this is actually her mummy, but it seems like that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, there's just like, you know, it's this there's always be very difficult to verify. Exactly. It's, it's very difficult to like a hundred percent, like without a shadow of a doubt, but like I more than my, likely it's her. Exactly. If I had to put a percentage, it's like 90% sure mm -hmm. that it is indeed her. 95%, whatever. I'm Again, I'm making this up. But um, we'll, we'll, I'll post a picture of her mummy on our Patreon. Not our Instagram because Instagram... Might censor it. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. It will definitely censor it. So um, if the mummy is indeed that of Hedgehub suit, which I do think it is, um, she would have stood at just actually over five feet tall. Oh. And we actually get some Petite. insight into how she died. Ooh. So she had bone cancer. 
Oh, wow. Yeah. That's why she died young. Yeah. And interestingly, she seems like she would have had long golden hair. What? Yes. Well, we know Ramses the second had red hair. What? And it's his mummy still has it. That's so weird. Her hair's gone. Yeah. But based off of DNA analysis, they could conclude that she probably had long golden hair and that we do know that she had red finger paint on the time of her death. She had red nails? She had red nails. Red nail theory. The ladies know. I even know. <laughs> and I'm not even a lady. That's because you it's listen to me babble on about my random yeah, stuff. Yeah, you're like my... Yeah, so your ancient history is like stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Like color <laughs> theory, red nail theory, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> That's like how... Do you, you tell me then. A ver, let's see if you really know. What's red nail theory? Red nail theory makes you more attractive and powerful to men. More powerful, yeah. It's like like all, like all men love it, sure. But like the most successful like women in business tend to, when they get their nails done, do red nails. Yeah. So that's her. I She's mean, a powerful woman. Even like when you look at let's say presidential debates, if you see the two candidates talk like debating, they're either going to have a blue tie or a red tie. I mean, that makes sense because of their parties too and our flag. Oh, uh, no, it's nothing. Oh, well, actually that's a good point. That doesn't really have anything to do with patriotism. It has everything to do with psychology. I think the red yeah. being like powerful and I don't know what the blue means. It makes you empathetic. Make you emp- oh yeah. And mm-hmm. also, yeah, if you have blue eyes, you know, it brings out the blue in your eyes. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm sure that's it. <laughs> yeah. I was joking on that last one guys. <laughs> okay. So, um, we also know that Hatshepsut had suffered from arthritis and even diabetes in her later years. Um, oh. and that she did and die of bone cancer. I wonder how she would have developed diabetes. I don't know. That's so weird. But yeah, we know she had diabetes. It's, isn't that wild? What was her diet? I have so many questions now. The you know, more you tell me, the more questions I have. I mean, that's how I feel about the, that unfinished obelisk. Mm, and the scoops. And the scoops. Weirdos, like, let us know what you think about the scoops. Ice cream scoopers? Yeah, I think so. I mean, our ice cream scooper that we have is pretty strong. So yeah. I feel like if you give a you know a thousand workers those, <laughs> I'm sure that I'm sure that's it. That's definitely it. <laughs> I'm 100 percent right. I know I am. <laughs> so, and and also the last thing I'll mention about her mummy, she's we know that she had some sort of skin condition. And sadly, she was making it worse with a carcinogenic lotion that she had. That's probably how she got bone cancer. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It kind of reminds me actually of that terrible Catwoman movie from like 20 years ago with Halle Berry. Mm-hmm. So the whole plot of that is like this pharmaceutical company is giving out this lotion that makes your skin look nice. But the problem is if you stop using it, then it like, it's like kills you. Oh, I get the movie was terrible, so I don't really remember the plot that well, but that's, I think, generally how the plot works. How sad. Because she was trying to treat whatever was going on and it was making her sick. Yeah, it was making her sick and it was probably making the condition even worse. So, regardless, yeah, the lotion made things worse and it probably hastened her death. Mm. So, Hatshepsut, like, she left a legacy of peace, stability, and prosperity, I think, throughout all of Egypt, right? She was a political mastermind and she was able to be a successful pharaoh going against practically thousands of years of history and precedence at this point. Yeah. I mean, that is not something to be take lightly. It's a big deal. It's a huge deal. You know, again, forgetting that one, maybe two pharaoh, female pharaohs came before her. Still, it's would have been in her world, especially that much harder to do everything she did as a woman. Exactly. And remember guys, Cleopatra wouldn't rule herself for almost 1500 years after Mm -hmm. this point. So she was still a long ways away. And it is really interesting that through some miracle and good archeology span that we actually were able to rediscover head Shepsut. Yay. Right. Because if, you know, the Rosetta Stone hadn't been found. If mm-hmm. we weren't able to dis- decipher some of the uh, hieroglyphs, we wouldn't know anything about her. Yeah. I'm so glad we do. Yeah. And that, my dear weirdos, is the story of Hatshepsut. Yay. Thank you so much. I didn't know pretty much anything about her. <laughs> so I learned a lot. Yeah. I, I love researching. Uh, I loved researching her because it is so, she's an enigma. 
you know yes. she's a really interesting character um in in like a historical character like i kind of put her in the same vein as like like a julius caesar or an alexander those are more like masculine conquering types mm. um but in the way the only reason I, I put them in kind of the same category is because they do things that are so contradictory like it's almost hard to get a pulse of like who they were as people mm-hmm. um especially with her though it, it's much harder because like the you know um the other two had biographers right? right and people writing about it at the time contemporaries whereas you know with her there aren't any yeah you don't have any of that her memory was or the memories of her were destroyed. Yeah. So that much harder again. Exactly. But you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you guys. Oh, thank you, babe. And thank you weirdos for listening. (laughs) So before I forget, I want to cite my sources. We have the history channel, Nat Geo, the Smithsonian. Smithsonian had a great long article about her. Um, The collector teach democracy.org, which I thought was kind of, was a pretty cool website. And then of course, our favorite Wikipedia. Amazing. Thank you for teaching us so much about Hepshetsu and just Egypt in general. You gave us a really good overview of Egyptian, ancient Egyptian history. Thank you. And weirdos, thank you for joining us for another episode. We're always so happy to be here. Do not forget to follow us on Instagram. If you don't, we post a lot of stuff there, like uh, images for our episodes. We are at History for Weirdos. And if you haven't done so already, rate the podcast review subscribe all of that good stuff because it helps other folks find the show yeah we can make even more weirdos yeah let's make more weirdos make more weirdos (laughs) make more weirdos (laughs) the worst chant ever the worst (laughs) but you know you tried that's all that matters yeah well with that weirdos that's it for this week until next time weirdos adios Yay!